in the ministry. What Edward Freeman is a rabbi and a family systems theorist, and he points out in our culture at present, there is a chronic, that chronic anxiety is systemic. It is highly infectious and it's spreading through the social systems at a swift pace. Despite our technical advances and the sheer amount of information available to us, our emotional landscape is being shaped by anxiety. Now, I'll never forget what this one leader used to, he used to ask leaders this simple question whenever he would meet with them. He would just simply ask them this. He would say, how's your peace? What's consuming your thoughts and your heart at this moment? What's been keeping you awake this week? I wonder if I was to ask you that question this morning, what you would say. How's your peace? What's, what's been consuming your thoughts and your mind this week? How have you been sleeping this week? You know, there might be people here this morning and you have spent the entire week wrestling anxiously. You've been consumed with worry and you've drowned that with all, in all sorts of ways. Well, this morning I'm hoping that you'll see from uh, the Bible that there is a far better way for dealing with our anxiety. Now, I know on Sunday morning that you've been studying through the book of Galatians and you've slowed down as you've come to the fruit of the Spirit. And you've been taking each aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, it is the fruit. There's only one fruit of the Spirit, but it has these different aspects, these different flavors, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And so this morning, we've come to the third aspect or fruit of the Spirit, which is peace. When we are walking by the Spirit, when we're controlled by the Holy Spirit, what will be flowing out of our lives will be peace. And so this morning, as we come to study this aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, peace, I want to break down my message into three parts. Firstly, I want to look at peace with God. What is it? Then I want to look at the peace of God. How is that different to peace with God? And then I want to finally show you how the peace with God and the peace of God are related to one another. So firstly, I want to look at peace with God. What is that? Then I want to have a look at the peace of God. How is that different from peace with God? And then finally, I want to show you how peace with God and the peace of God are related. So first, let's look at peace with God. Now, a place to go in the Bible that spells out peace with God is Romans chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, open them up or your phone, open it up to Romans chapter 5 this morning. And in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul says this, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now, Charles Swindoll, a big preacher from the United States, he says that this statement should bring us great emotional relief. We have peace with God. The type of relief that comes when you go to the doctor and they say that your results are negative and you don't have cancer. Or the type of relief that comes upon a student when they find out, especially if they've left their assignment to the last moment, that they have actually another week to do their assignment. That's the type of relief that this statement should bring us, that we have peace with God. So let me ask you a question. Did you feel that emotional relief this morning as we read that out? You have peace with God. Well, let's be honest. Probably not. And I think the reason is, is that most of us have forgotten, or most of us tend to think that we are not that bad, and that at best, we were probably just neutral with God. But Paul paints a very different picture in the book of Romans. He says that before someone becomes a Christian, they're not just neutral with God, rather they are in a war with God. Paul says before you became a Christian, even though you may not know this, before you became a Christian, your mind was hostile to God. You were set on serving yourself, serving idols, and therefore you were at war with God. But not only were you at war with God, 
The Bible says that God was at war with you. In Romans 1 verse 18, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. You see, God as the creator of this universe, he is righteously angry at the way that we have sinned against him and replaced him. And he's righteously angry at the way that we sin against one another. And when he looks down and see the world in the mess that, he, that it's in with people fighting and all of the, all the horrible things that happen in the world, God is righteously angry. Now, I don't know about you, but the one person that I don't want to have as an enemy is the all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent God. Jesus put it this way. He said, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. He said, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So before someone becomes a Christian, they're at war with God, even though they may not have realized it, and God is at war with them. But here's the great news. At great cost to God, if a person has believed in Christ, the war is over over. A peace treaty has been signed. Paul says, since we have been justified by faith, since God has satisfied his anger towards sin through pouring his anger out on Jesus, we have been justified. We are at peace with God. What a relief. The hostility is over. So peace with God is the present standing of a believer before God through the objective work of Jesus on their behalf. But of course, the hostility is only over if the war has ended. God has made a way through the death of His Son. He has dealt with His just wrath for us personally through pouring out His wrath upon His Son. But there is only peace if both parties agree to peace. You know, in the Second World War, there was only peace between the Allies and the Axis forces when Germany surrendered and gave up their war against the rest of the world. And then, you know, there can only be peace with God. You can only have peace with God when you give up your war against God. When you humble yourself and agree to his terms of peace, when you stop living for yourself and you turn to God and say, God, I admit I'm a sinner. Thank you for what Jesus has done. I just surrender and I give myself to you. Remember, as I said, you don't want as an enemy the all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent God. It might seem like you are winning right now. But in the end, we'll all stand before God. And we don't want to stand before him still at war with him, especially when he's done everything necessary for that war to be over. However, if you're a Christian here this morning, then the great news is the war is over. There is a peace agreement that has been signed in the blood of Jesus. Now, you might say, well, I just sinned last night and I don't feel like I'm at peace with God. I don't feel like I'm reconciled to God. Well, The great news is that you still are. You see, as I've already said, um, our peace with God is not a subjective reality. It's an objective fact. You see, there is a difference between subjective things, things that we feel on the inside, and objective things, things that are true. You see, objective things are things that are true regardless of how we feel. Now, you might say, like this morning, I don't feel like it's the 3rd of November, but it doesn't matter how you feel. It's the 3rd of November, regardless of how you feel. If, and if you believe the gospel, regardless of how you feel, you are already at peace with God. Now, Paul underscores this truth at the end of the paragraph. Look down in your Bibles in verse 9. Paul says, Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Now, Paul is using an argument from the lesser to the greater. Paul is saying that if God has done the greater thing, then he'll certainly do the lesser thing. You see, if God reconciled you to himself when you were his enemy by sending his son to die for you, then how much more will he 
presently deal with your present sin and keep you at peace with him, now you are his child. You know, my, my uh, parents, they live in Harvey Bay, Queensland, and we often go to Queensland to visit them. And with our kids, we have five children. It can often be a very long trip from Adelaide all the way to their house in Harvey Bay. You know, firstly, we have to take a plane trip from Adelaide to Brisbane. And this was especially a long trip when my kids were just small, when they were like just children. Kids on a plane is, is, is a nightmare. But then not only did we have to travel from Adelaide to Brisbane, then we, then we had to travel like four hours from Brisbane north to Harvey Bay in, in a car. Now, if we were willing to make that great journey from Adelaide all the way to their house in Harvey Bay, would we not be, certainly be willing to make the small journey when we rocked up at their house from being outside of their house to get out of our car and go and knock on the door? Of course we would. If we made the great journey, we'd, we would make the small journey. And you see, this is what Paul is saying. If God was willing, while you were his enemy, to reconcile him to yourself when you were his enemy, how much more is he able to keep you at peace with him? Now you are his child. As he says, as Jude says in Jude 24, he is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory. So that is peace with God. But as I said, peace with God is different from the peace of God. Peace with God is this objective reality if you are a believer. It's true, as I said, regardless of how you feel, it exists outside of you. But the peace of God is different. Peace of God, the peace of God is subjective. It's something that happens inside of you. So what is this peace of God? Well, probably the key passage in the New Testament for the peace of God is Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. So if you turn over your Bibles to Philippians 4, you'll notice down in verse 6, Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. Now, the word anxious in the New Testament means to be pulled in different directions. And you know, that's exactly what it feels like when you're anxious, isn't it? You feel like you're being pulled in all these different directions. You feel this inner turmoil inside. Now, you might say, well, it's very easy for Paul to say, don't be anxious. But I mean, Paul was an apostle. You know, we tend to think of Paul like this superhero, you know, who has this cape that would fly in the background, who would stand on a building and say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We tend to think of him as this more than superhuman sort of character. But Paul knew what it was like to suffer. You see, straight after Paul was converted, he was greatly used by God. We read about him confounding the Jews in the synagogues, but straight away he had to leave because of persecution. He also received these two direct revelations from God. But nevertheless, wherever he went, imprisonments and beatings followed him. He was sent out by the church at Antioch to plant churches, and he ran around planting churches and making disciples, and he was by far the most effective gospel worker in the world at that time. And Paul had this burden to go to Jerusalem, but when he, was arri when he arrived in Jerusalem, Paul was arrested for no apparent reason. He then spent two years being bumped around from prison to prison. And then he, because he appealed to, to, to take his case before Caesar, uh, he had to go to Rome, which took more of his time. And on his way to Rome, the ship on which he was traveling sank and was sh shipwrecked. And so Paul, when he, when he says these words, do not be anxious, he is writing these words from house arrest in Rome. Paul is waiting for his case to be brought before Caesar. And he doesn't know whether Caesar is going to let him go free or whether Caesar is going to kill him. So Paul knew what it was like to carry burdens. He knew what it was like to be in the pressure cooker of life. But notice he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation and circumstance, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now Paul uses three words here. Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. The word prayer is a general word for making requests 
known to the Lord. It carries with it the idea of adoration and devotion and worship. You know, whenever we are filled with fear, our first thought should be to get alone with God and to worship Him, to focus on His majesty and His greatness. Because oftentimes, if we focus on our problems, our problems become large and our God becomes small. But if we take time to focus on the greatness and glory of God, we'll see how, he, how big He is and how small our problems are. Warren Wearsby writes, too often we rush into his presence and hastily tell him our needs when we ought to approach his throne calmly and with deepest reverence. The second word is supplication. Uh, this is the Greek word for asking with urgency based upon a presumed need. You know, when you are filled with anxiety, this is no time for half-hearted, insincere requests. You come to God and you call out to him raise your voice in faith and, and bring your requests to God. And then after adoration and supplication comes appreciation, giving thanks to God. Now, God the Father certainly enjoys His children when they come to Him and say, thank you, Father, for all that you've done. But thanksgiving is also in a very important discipline because when we thank God, we actually we actually put our focus on His hand and we come to see how He's working already in our circumstances. We're tracing His hand in our circumstances. And then there is this amazing promise that comes. Look down in verse 7. Paul says, if we bring our request to God, verse 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, this is supernatural peace, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, the two things that you need guarded most when you're in the grip of anxiety is your heart and your mind, the way you think and the way you feel. I don't know if this happens to you, but it happens to me. I'll encounter some sort of difficulty or I'll be in some sort of conflict with someone and I won't be able to stop thinking about it. I'll lay awake at night thinking about this person what I'm going to say, how I'm going to respond, what they're going to say, how I'm going to counter what they're going to say. And what I need most in those moments is I mean, need something to stand over my heart and my mind, something to pr protect my thoughts from rushing to dark places. And Paul says that's what the peace of God does. It guards your heart and your mind. So what is the peace of God? Well, I define the peace of God this way. The peace of God is the settled assurance given by God through prayer that He is in control of my circumstances and my life is in His hands. The peace of God is this settled assurance, this supernatural assurance that God gives me as I lay my requests before Him that He is in control of my circumstances and my life is actually safe in his hands. Horatio Spafford knew something of God's unexpected, of life's unexpected challenges. He was a successful attorney and real estate investor who lost a fortune in the great Chicago fire of 1871. Around the same time, his beloved son, who was four years old, died of scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do his family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship to England, planning to join them after he finished pre some pressing business at home. However, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and sunk. More than 200 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's precious daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy, and upon arriving in England, she just sent this telegram with these words, saved alone. Horatio immediately set sail for England, and at one point during his voyage, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that had struck the Spafford family, summoned Horatio to tell him that they were now passing over the spot where the shipwreck had occurred. As Horatio thought about his daughters, words of comfort and hope filled his heart and mind, and he wrote them down, and they have become the well-loved hymn, It is well with my soul. It goes like this, When peace like a river attendeth my way, 
when sorrows like sea billows roll, when those sorrows just keep on coming like waves of the ocean. Have you ever had a period of life that's like that? Where it just seems when one wave hits you and you're sort of knocked off balance, all of a sudden another wave hits you and another wave hits you and another wave hits you. Have you ever had life like that? He says, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. You see, the peace of God is that supernatural assurance that God gives that it is well with my soul. While everything outside of me might still be raging on, it's the assurance that God is in control of my circumstances. My life is in His hand. He's sovereignly over my life. So how is peace with God and, pe and the peace of God related? How is this objective right standing that we have before God and the subjective assurance that He is in control of my circumstances related? Well, they are related in this way. Listen up very carefully. Peace with God enables me to experience the peace of God. Let me say that again. Peace with God. God enables me to experience the peace of God. The objective reality that I am now at peace with God enables me to experience the subjective reality that He is in control of my life. And I think it does so in two ways. First, because I'm at peace with God, because I'm standing before Jesus in His righteousness alone, I can therefore approach the throne of grace whenever I need to find grace and help in my time of need. But when you think about it, what is one of the reasons that prevents me from approaching the throne of grace? One of the things that prevents me from approaching the throne of grace is because I don't feel like I'm accepted by God. I feel like I'm still under his condemnation. But if you're a Christian this morning, therefore there is now no condemnation because you are in Christ Jesus. You are at peace with God. God's just wrath for your sin has been satisfied in full by the work of Jesus. Now there is conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit does convict us of sin. But conviction is completely different from condemnation. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, it's always to liberate us. But there is another person who will speak to us about our sin. The Bible says in Revelation 12 verse 10 that the devil is the accuser of Christians. And he accuses them day and night. Before we're tempted, he'll come to us and he'll say, go do it. You can get away with it. God won't mind. But after we've sinned, he then condemns us. He says, you stinky Christian. How could you do such a thing? You'll never be able to make up for what you've done. And he throws this wet blanket of condemnation over us. And many Christians, unfortunately, believe his lies. Many Christians, they are in a prison of condemnation. They feel so bad about their sin, and it's like they have this wet blanket smothering them. Terry Virgo, in his book, Lavish Grace, writes this. He says, If you are not thoroughly persuaded that God has given you the free gift of righteousness that makes you acceptable to God, you will constantly be battling with a sense of disqualification and guilt. I read a book a while ago by Charles Price, and in it he tells this story about a woman that he met while ministering. She had told him that for 20 years she had confessed to God a particular sin that she had committed in her teenage years. He didn't ask her for the details, but she said for 20 years, and she was now 40, she'd confessed this sin to God every day. And she said, the memory of that sin and the consequence of that sin has sat on me the whole time. It has impacted my marriage, she said. It's made me a poor mother to my children. 
She told Charles that the church that she attended asked if she would teach a Sunday school class several times because she was very good with children. But she said, I turned it down every time because I know what I'm like. I know my past. I couldn't possibly serve God because of my past history. You see, there are many Christians that are just like that. They're in a prison of condemnation. The devil is very clever. Before you came to Christ, he was preventing you from seeing Christ, and now you are in Christ. He's preventing you from enjoying the full benefits of your justification. And maybe you are here this morning, and you are just like that lady that Charles spoke about. You can't move forward because of your past history. But let me tell you the good news is that if you've trusted in Christ, you're at peace with God, and you need to claim that objective peace. You need to have your feet shod, as Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 15, in the gospel of peace. You need to take your stand on the objective peace of the gospel. And that objective piece of the gospel should give you the confidence to approach the throne of grace, confess your sins, and approach God when you need to in your time of need. But there is a second and more powerful way, I believe, that peace with God enables us to experience the peace of God. And it's not, it's, you see, it's not only that peace with God gives us the confidence to run to God with our burdens, but peace with God silences our raging consciences. You see, if I'm not experiencing the peace of God, then it's often because I've moved from trusting the objective work of Christ on my behalf, and I'm trusting in something else for my justification and security. If I lay awake at bed at night, do some of you know what I'm talking about? Do you do this? If I lay awake at bed at night when I'm in conflict with someone and I'm thinking about what they said and what I'm going to say and all of those sort of reasons and I'm building my case and I'm building my defense up, if, if I'm doing that, it's because in that moment, I am not trusting. I'm not trusting that I'm justified by faith alone, that I'm righteous because of Jesus. I'm trying to establish my own righteousness. If I'm laying awake at bed at night, worried about my future, worried what's going to happen in my future, it's because I'm not trusting presently that my future has been secured for me by Christ. My future is done by Him. I'm, I'm looking to myself, and I think that my own works will satisfy my future. And so do you see that peace with God enables me to experience the peace of God? You see, ironically, by looking outside of me to the objective work of Christ on my behalf, it helps actually silence what's happening inside of me. As I look to Jesus, as I rest in Jesus, as I put my full faith in Jesus, then it silences the raging seas that are happening inside of me. And so, this is the coolest part, all right? So coming back to Galatians 5, verse 22, and the fruit of the Spirit. I hope you've been with me, because this is so cool, all right? Paul says that one of the key aspects of the fruit of the Spirit is peace. And why is this a fruit of the Spirit? Why is peace a fruit of the Spirit? Because what does the Spirit want to do in your life and in my life? The Spirit is given to magnify Jesus, to magnify Jesus and His work. That's why the Spirit is given. So the objective work of Jesus on your behalf comes to sink down in deep into your hearts. And what was the problem in Galatia? You've been studying the book of Galatians. What was the problem? What doctrine was under threat? The gospel. That's a, that's a question you can answer. What, what doctrine was under threat in the book of Galatians? You've been studying the book of Galatians. What doctrine was under threat? Justification by faith. They were adding to the gospel. 
And when you add to the gospel, you won't have peace. You won't have peace. If you, if you started to think that it's by your works that you are made acceptable before God, you won't have peace. You see, ironically, ironically, many of, many of you may have walked in this morning and you think that your biggest problem is outside of you and the solution is to deal with something inside of you. That you need to muster up the courage to deal with that problem that's outside of you. That's not the gospel. The gospel says the opposite. Your biggest problem is inside of you and you need to look outside of you to Jesus to rescue you, to save you. You need to look to him, to him and his objective work on your behalf. And it is a completed work. On the cross, Jesus said these words. It, can anyone finish it with me? It is finished. The work is done. The work is done. And so in order to enjoy the peace of God, you need to look outside of you and you need to trust in the fact that you are at peace with God through the objective work of Jesus. Maybe you came in this morning and there is just, as I said, this week you did not sleep. There is anxiety and there's a whole, whole heap of stuff going on in your life. Well, this morning, I invite you to come and look, not inside, look outside to Jesus rest in his finished work and then run to him and lay down your burdens at his feet and what you'll find rising in your heart is this assurance that if he's dealt with the biggest issues of your life which was your sin and was your eternal future he will be able to deal with your present situation and circumstance your life is in his hands and as he says in John 10 you're so safe and secure Jesus says in John 10 that anyone who is in me, they're in the Father's hand and they're also in my hands. I'm holding you. You're in his hands. Your life is under his control. So I invite you to come this morning, look outside of you, look to the finished work of Christ on your behalf. Let me pray for you. Father, we just thank you so much that peace with God enables us to experience the peace of God. And then it enables us to be at peace with other people. We no longer have to defend ourselves. We no longer have to prove that we're right. We can take feedback. We can actually speak the truth in love. And so the peace of God enables peace with other people, other believers as well. And so, Father, I pray that this church would be a church that experiences this aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, that every heart in this church experiences the peace of God and then becomes peacemakers so that this church is a place of peace where our, re our relationship with you is reconciled and our relationships with others are reconciled through the work of Jesus on our behalf. And so, Lord, we bring our burdens before you. We, before you this morning. We lay them down before you. Lord, as I pray that as we lay them down in exchange, you would give us the assurance that you're in control, that you're in control, Lord. And so I pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen.